Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to you from the Emerald Planet, coming from Washington, D.C. and the United States as we look around the globe in 143 different nations, some 750 cities, and 50,000 communities looking for the very best practices. Best practices that can use to be, bring about the issues and address the issues of climate change, uh, looking at alternative energy production, clean water, health care, education, and all the other needed services, the technologies, and the products that can lead us through the 21st century. We have two gentlemen that are going to be working with us on this particular program, and uh, we're calling this the uh, Cities of Now, the Cities of Now, looking at these uh, as green, sustainable, and also entrepreneurial as we're addressing uh, community solutions and looking at how these can be taken care of for the many problems that we're facing as we move through the 21st century. And Joseph N. Pelton, Dr. Pelton, has been with us before. Uh, he is a prolific author, and he has two books that we're going to be talking about and using as the base of our conversation, Future Cities and Mega Crunch. And I like both of those uh, names on that, uh, Dr. Joe, if I can call you that. And uh, coming... Uh, uh, to uh, the uh, cities around us, as we know, about 54% of the world's population now live in urban areas. And uh, most of those, the mega cities, 10 million or more, are in actually the developing world, as we think about the developed uh, countries and having larger cities. And that's really not true anymore. And that's something you found out in uh, your research and your studies. Tell us a little bit about future cities and mega crunch. And then let's get in some of the statistics and set the stage for what we're going to be talking about over these next two segments. Well, the world is changing, and the world has been changing uh, for a long time. But if you go back four million years, uh, when humans first uh, came to this planet, uh, we had a very small population. And we, for millions of years, when we uh, were hunters and gatherers, uh, had a very small population. And if we ran into a problem, we just picked up and moved to another place, uh, got another cave. Uh, but once we started agriculture about 10,000 years ago, we settled down. We began building towns and cities and so on. Uh, we began fighting wars uh, uh, over uh, the land that we had. And uh, we found we could sustain much larger populations. And so instead of 100 million people, uh, we kept growing. And in the last few centuries, we've been growing exponentially. Uh, well, I think it's just really interesting here, and I want to bring up this first slide that uh, we have as far as the uh, world population. And, uh, and we're going to superimpose on this a little later on as far as the natural disasters and this whole notion of the population. So tell us about this chart and uh, how that this is really having an impact as far as uh, energy, food production, and uh, also maybe even uh, natural disasters. Right. Well, uh, if we go back to 1800, we were about 800 million people on the planet. Uh, 1900, we had more than doubled that to 1.8 billion people, 1900. Mm -hmm. At the year 2000, we were six and a half billion people, which meant that we had increased in 100 years more than three, three times. And uh, in this century, we probably will double at least uh, to 12 billion people. And the point is, how many people can our planet sustain? And here we're not talking just about food. Actually, water is probably going to be the first thing. They're saying right that's out really of, the well, biggest right, issue that we have right now. Biggest issue. But uh, also we're talking about uh, resources, whether we're talking about oil uh, or whatever it is that we're consuming. And it's not only the fact that we're going to have 12 billion people, but these are much more prosperous people who want uh, air conditioning and they want cars and they want 
big homes and so on. And the point is, can we sustain 12 billion people? Or in the 22nd uh, century, is it 24 billion people? Or is it 48 billion people? The point is, we need to start thinking about sustainability. In other words, can we sustain life uh, on the planet the way uh, we would like in terms of uh, enough jobs for people, uh, enough resources for people, enough water and food, and uh, what is a reasonable number? Well, this uh, whole thing, Joe, we're talking about as far as this, uh, this balance, and uh, this is really the issue is how do we balance the natural resources we have uh, with humankind, but also is how do we evolve the technologies, the processes, the products, the efficiencies, if we will, of the natural resources to make sure that we have an increase in quality of life and not just say we're going to maintain and people in the developing world are going to have to do without because they're saying, look, last three or four hundred years, uh, you guys in the developed world have lived very well and we want a part of that as well. And, and we have to be true to humankind and say, you know, this is a natural right, but we also have to protect the environment so we can all continue to exist on this planet. Right. Well, today, 80 percent of our energy comes from carbon-based uh, resources, oil or coal or what have you. Uh, that's not sustainable. And that, uh, to me, the 22nd century has to be a century where we're basically uh, dependent on solar-based energy. Uh, today, we get 10,000 times more energy from the sun than we use. And it just doesn't make sense for us to figure out a way to use that renewable resource from the sun for all of our energy needs to create a more sustainable environment. Well, and of course, it's not for just cities in the U.S. that there are cities in China that no one's ever even heard about that have populations of seven or eight or even 10 million people. And uh, these uh, uh, people want energy, they want cars and so on. Uh, they're adding something like 40,000 cars on the street of Beijing every week. And uh, this is not sustainable. So one of the key issues uh, where this all comes together in terms of the city of the future is a reduction or at least a stabilization of population. That this comes in terms of employment, it comes in terms of resources, in terms of food, water, what have you. We can't just continue doubling our population forever. Yeah, and looking at this uh, slide we just had up here, this uh, watering hole in Ethiopia, uh, we have some very interesting slides that you're sharing with us tonight. And this gives us an idea about, you know, how do we bring the sustainability as far as uh, food, water, and power, which are the three key elements that we have. And if you have those three, then that leads to the employment, either creating your own, uh, own small business right or uh, creating jobs for others. So uh, looking at this whole notion of uh, the people here at the watering hole, how do we extrapolate this across the globe and say, how do we best look at these resources and balance that with humankind and the resources that we have and those resources that we'll be able to create from this new source, i.e. the solar, the wind, the hydrogen, and the other uh, renewable sources? Well, the first thing we do have to recognize is that when people say climate change is going to create problems and people may have to change and move to different areas, it's already happening. In other words, uh, there are tens of millions of people who have had to leave northern Africa due to the lack of water. And that uh, climate change, which is a much better term mm -hmm. than using uh, global warming, because climate changing is not just things are getting hot rain patterns. So we're going to see areas where rain now occurs that there'll be more rain, but in areas where there's been drought, there's going to be more drought. And so we're already seeing people uh, moving. And when people move, as I say, uh, people fight and wars happen. So uh, this is not only a matter of being green or sustainable, it really is uh, uh, looking to such things as how do we minimize war and conflict, uh, how do we create jobs, and how do we use this as an opportunity. 
Well, one yeah, of the each, each time you have uh, a problem, it mm -hmm. also creates an opportunity for more innovative jobs, uh, more uh, innovative things uh, like Chuck Wollmer is going to be talking about. Right. Well, the most inefficient uh, way of using resources, of course, is war. And the whole thing about this, uh, Joe, with the, the work that you've done over many years, the whole notion of the underlying theme is peace and abundance, you're not war and uh, scarcity. And that's what we're talking about here. But looking at this two decades of incredible change, uh, I just love this chart that you have. Uh, let's go through that. We have two, uh, two of these charts, and let's just spend a little time with this. We only have about two and a half minutes, so let's uh, look at this balance, and, and what are we really seeing here? Well, first of all, if you look at China, that, uh, yes, there's been a population increase, but in terms of the standard of living and the income, uh, it has had the biggest increase of any uh, country uh, in the world. Uh, we see that both... Uh, China and uh, India have had uh, significant increases in their uh, standard of living and their uh, GNP per capita, and that uh, uh, all of the developing countries, in effect, have had a larger percentage increase in mm -hmm. terms of income. Right. But when you look at income, you also realize that's a stand-in for consumption of energy in terms of uh, getting cars, uh, larger houses, uh, more energy consumption. And so uh, this world uh, that we live in is changed significantly uh, by the fact that uh, you've had this huge increase in population, but an even uh, much greater uh, increase in economic uh, uh, income and consumption levels, and that particularly uh, China and India, which represent now close to 40 percent of the world's population, uh, they're starting to drive uh, our energy needs, uh, our resource needs, and so on. And so the cost of uh, all commodities around the world uh, are going to be driven uh, by these very large uh, countries. And if they don't control uh, their uh, population, and everybody controls their population, we're really going to find uh, that we have a massive problem with unemployment. We're going to have a massive problem with not enough resources. And it's going to be an increasingly large problem. Uh, well, we have all... only about uh, 30, well, actually yeah. about uh, 20 seconds left okay. now, Joe. Uh, this global village, hit it quick. Well, it, it basically just shows uh, how small uh, that North America is 7% of the village. And we consume uh, like 40% of the resources. That's going to change. And that's not sustainable. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe Pelton, for being with us. And thank you as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. She's had more than a dozen fractures. And in the next few years, she faces two major surgeries to strengthen her fragile bones. She's only 10 years old. Most people don't worry about fragile bones until late in life. For those with osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bones are a concern throughout their lifetime. Find out how you can strengthen this child's future. Diabetes is a killer. After I was diagnosed, I didn't feel sick, so I didn't listen to my doctor. Then it struck. I had a heart attack, then a stroke, and I was only 49. Most people with diabetes also have high blood pressure and cholesterol, which can cause severe heart damage. In fact, two out of three people with diabetes die from heart disease or stroke. Don't let diabetes destroy your life. Call for your free diabetes survival guide. Choose to live.
to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Thank you for being with us as we come to you from Washington, D.C., looking around the globe in 143 different nations, looking for the best processes, the technologies, and the products that can be used to address climate change, but also a rapidly expanding population base. We're now at about 7 billion souls. They're saying we could be at 9 billion by 2050, and by the end of the century, maybe a double of all of this to about 12 billion people. So how do we address these issues as far as uh, food, water, sanitation, health care, education, all the basic human needs that we have at the same time to be able to produce the energy that's needed in a renewable source? And we have Dr. Uh, Joseph N. Pelton, who is a professor and the dean retired from the International Space University in Switzerland. Also, he's a prolific writer and author. Uh, he has two books that we're dealing with, talking about the uh, mega crunch and uh, future cities. So let's bring up this uh, very first slide. This is really telling here, Joe. Tell us where this is, what actually are we looking at in all this mass of humanity? Well, this is a day of beach uh, in China. And uh, the question is, is this our future? Uh, that uh, can we basically look to the future uh, in uh, intelligent ways, in terms of tax policy and other things, to basically give incentives to people to have a zero population growth of looking to the future, so that we don't go to from 12 billion to 24 billion to 48 billion, uh, and uh, that we cannot have the quality of life, we can't have the resources we need. Now, looking at the uh, the 1.3 billion uh, souls in in China. Of course, India is rapidly catching up, and they're right. saying within maybe the next five years, India is going to surpass uh, China as far as population, right. and uh, certainly keeping up as far as uh, GDP is concerned. So looking at this whole notion of uh, global prosperity and uh, education and other things, because the world in many ways is becoming much richer than it has been in uh, the past uh, centuries, how do we balance this notion of the use of natural resources uh, the market economies, and this ever-expanding uh, growth in population? Well, um, Singapore uh, approached it the following fashion. Uh, the Lee Kuan Yew, the prime minister, basically said, our tax policy going forward will be if you have one child, you'll get a tax uh, benefit. If you have two children, you lose all tax benefits. And if you have three children, you will have to pay a tax penalty. And amazingly, uh, Singapore achieved a zero population growth uh, very quickly. Now, there are certain communities where maybe this won't work. Maybe it'll have to be on a village incentive that if you basically control your population, you will get uh, a new energy uh, installation or you'll get lighting or you'll get other benefits. Or uh, maybe a larger home right. or greater right. rations as right. far as food is concerned, what have you. Absolutely. But the point is, we need to look at the economics and, and the changing economics. Uh, and that the fact is the U.S. Uh, and the uh, OECD countries, uh, if you will, uh, they for many years were 65% of the world economy. Uh, today that's shrunk to uh, 50% and it's projected uh, by the head of the World Bank that uh, in uh, 30 years uh, the uh, U.S. and Europe uh, may represent uh, only 25 percent of the world economy. And the reason for that is not the fact that we're becoming so much uh, smaller in all of that. It's the fact is that these developing nations around the globe, if you look at what's going on, uh, uh, China, India, Brazil, South Indonesia. Africa, Russia, some of these countries are just growing at a very prodigious rate, right. and they're going to continue to grow at those right. rates. But consuming a huge amount of energy, a huge amount of resources, and uh, this is going to drive up the cost of uh, resources. It's going to be inflationary. And uh, so there are economic reasons to be green. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Copenhagen, which is one of the greenest cities uh, in uh, the world, uh, they have the, the lowest uh, greenhouse gases per capita of any major city in the world. They did this not because they wanted to be green or because of sustainability. They did it for economic reasons, that uh, when they had a crisis in the 70s, they realized that they were too dependent 
on foreign uh, supplies of energy. And so they basically went green for economic reasons. And that's the main message I'm trying to do. Go green not because it's uh, something to do because you want to hug a tree. It's because it's economically uh, important and sustainability is uh, really important uh, for a wide variety of areas, particularly in terms of future jobs. If we have too many people, there aren't going to be enough jobs to go around. And that's the whole thing. Uh, the key word in uh, this chart is really sustainability. And this is a thing that I observed, uh, you know, doing a lot of work with uh, China, is that as they were ramping up to prepare for the 2008 Olympics, they were looking at their infrastructure. And of course, they were moving the old uh, smokestack industries out of Beijing, way out into the countryside. And they realized very quickly is that we're uh, expanding the, the economy. We have this uh, even growing population base, even if it's you know one child per family. But at the same time, we can make more money by going green. And so they really just uh, just going at all areas right. as far as renewable resources. Right. And, and they outstripped the U.S. in terms of solar cell production, in terms of windmill uh, production, and so on. It's not that we aren't doing things, but they are increasing uh, their green energy again for economic reasons that they realize this is a good thing to do it's nice to be green but that they see this as an industry of the future and employment for their people well the whole the thing future. is it goes back to uh, creating your own small business uh, jobs 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 and more jobs so all this really uh, relates to everything to back to the economy and it's just being smarter and not working harder the old concept of that right. and also using renewables i like what you were talking about as far as the amount of energy coming out of the sun and it's a greater propensity in anything that we're using today, and yet in most cases we're just wasting it. Right. And, and basically cities going green uh, and being smarter starts with, if you will, smart energy, but also it means uh, planning your economics, your jobs, and your cultural and social needs. Uh, it doesn't start with the architecture, it doesn't start with bricks and mortar, it starts with what do you need to sustain a, a community, uh, making it uh, sustainable for the long range, uh, economically, culturally, socially? Well, the whole thing, too, about it is just like uh, Washington, D.C., where we're located, is that there are more people moving into the city because as the, uh, the fuel prices continue to increase, as it's becoming more expensive for food, even in the United States, people are saying if we move more into the city, we can walk. Uh, we can actually have uh, home gardens. There's many things that can be done on a very small, concentrated area. And so as the population expands, as Washington, D.C. has done now for the first time in about 60 years, is actually the resources are becoming more available within the, the core of the city itself. And what you're saying, Joe Pelton, is that if we look around the globe at all these cities, actually you can extract these resources and uh, to better humankind there from within the city itself. Correct. And uh, if we are 75% uh, of everybody in cities in 2050, uh, we really need to start planning for that transition now. That uh, uh, clearly you can have jobs in rural areas and it's good to have rural areas still for farming and so on, but more and more the future of our planet will be uh, the cities and planning those cities to be sustainable and uh, uh, produce your energy. You can actually put solar cells not only at the top of buildings, but you can put them on the side of buildings. Uh, you can uh, generate uh, your uh, energy and use the heat uh, rather than just throwing it away. Uh, for uh, your cogeneration and a whole host of technologies. Well, even uh, the technology is there for producing water from within the, you know, the humidity of your own home with the condominium, the apartment, or the single detached house. So there's many ways to get at this whole thing, and I like this community-based uh, solutions that you know, you've come up with. And I know you're working on uh, three books. Tell us a little bit about some of these uh, new books you're working right, on right. and how does it relate to this community-based solutions, which really goes back to our power for peace that we have right. in Emerald Planet. Well, the, the new book I'm working on is called Safe Cities, Living in a Dangerous World. And it basically talks about uh, that you need to do a number of things to prepare for um, a sustainable city, uh, but also uh, to protect against... Uh, uh, disasters. We'll talk about that in a, a few uh, minutes. But our cities 
are more and more vulnerable uh, to the infrastructure. So if you create all this new infrastructure, you need to be able to protect it against uh, disasters. But I do have a couple of slides showing some of the new technology that uh, is coming. And we're going to share uh, these with you. So the whole sustainability, and I like this notion that you have, Joe, about sustainability it drives the economy and not just the market itself because right. we have to sustain an ever-expanding population right. base. Right. So, you know, for a long time, our whole markets uh, have been uh, based on the idea that you have to have more and more people to grow a market. Well, we need to create uh, more clever markets uh, using new technologies uh, that there's a, a whole host of, of new technologies, in the solar cell technology, uh, other green uh, technologies uh, that will be uh, much more cost effective than anything we've had in the past. Um, now, look at uh, this whole notion, this threat of uh, super automation as we move through here, uh, and this is part of your mega crunch. What, what does this really mean, super automation? Well, uh, I think all of these things come together. In other words, overpopulation, uh, technological unemployment, uh, the, uh, the changing market that drives us more towards sustainability. We need to make all of these things happen together or we really will be in a crunch that uh, if you uh, create more and more efficiency, if you have smart machines that can replace more and more jobs, uh, uh, things like uh, people who lay out ads, uh, people who do assessments and so on. Again, more and more are these jobs being done by machines. And the point is uh, not to throw out the technology, but basically adapt uh, to a new type of environment where you can create new jobs uh, that help uh, sustainability, uh, that make us uh, better protected against disasters, uh, and uh, also much more uh, small business oriented and uh, much more community oriented than what we've done in the past. I want to look at this chart right here. We're talking about the uh, technologies, but uh, this is something we use in our Power for Peace as far as the uh, Category 6 to 8 uh, earthquakes. And, uh, and then also population shift, 15 seconds, that's very quick. Do you see an overlay or correlation between this increase? Well, we have seen a huge increase in uh, earthquakes in our cities. We also have uh, solar flares that could wipe out our energy grids and our computers. And we need to uh, redesign our cities to be protected against uh, earthquakes, solar flares, uh, even cosmic collisions. And we aren't doing enough and we and aren't smart enough. That's all about the Emerald Planet. And thank you for being with us. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about green dust. Nothing very nice. But a homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Yeah. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh. Oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. We're back 
to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C., looking around the globe in 143 different nations and uh, looking at the very best ways as far as the technologies, the processes, and the products that can be used to bring about an increasing quality of life for citizens around the globe. Uh, we have uh, an ever-expanding population base. We're now at about 7 billion souls, and that's supposed to go to about 9 billion souls by 2050, and possibly at 12 billion by the end of the century. And so how are we going to get at the, the water, the health care, the, just everything that we need as far as the uh, natural resources to take care of this expanding uh, population base? And at the same time, we need to have the employment, the jobs, and uh, the small businesses that we're going to be able to create the employment to actually pay for all the needs that we have. Uh, we have a gentleman uh, sitting with me. It's a, a dear friend and colleague of mine, Chuck Vollmer, who's here. And uh, he is uh, also an author. We have lots of authors coming in here, Chuck. So uh, you guys writing these books. But uh, his whole notion is called Jobonomics. Jobonomics. And he's looking at to create 20 million jobs by 2020. And I'm going to repeat this because I'm going to put him on the hook. Where he's going to explain about what this is all about. 20 million jobs by 2020. And uh, Chuck Vollmer, thank you. Glad you're here. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, the government spent about a uh, trillion dollars. And this is governments at all level, local, state, and federal. And nobody's created 20 million jobs. So how is Jobonomics going to do that? Lay it on us. Well, we laid out a plan uh, that, uh, that really focuses on the private sector. These are 20 million private sector jobs by, t by 2020. Uh, this is a historically, uh, since World War II, uh, we have created uh, between 10 and 20 million uh, jobs per decade. Uh, so in the last decade, in the 1990s, we produced 21 million jobs. Now, this decade of the aughts, from 2000 to, to 2010, we lost a million jobs. And so the question is, how do we get back to what we did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, about 20 million jobs? So what we're doing then is we're really going back and reclaiming the, this legacy that we had, yeah. Chuck, of creating all these jobs. Now we've lost it. Now what we're doing is we're developing a plant, a real plant, a road map, right. to be able to, to reclaim but actually expand those jobs for expanding population base. That's right. So if you look at the, the demographics and, and what is it, in the United States right now, we about 13% are in the good producing. That's manufacturing, construction. 87% are in the service industries. And so we're focusing largely on the service industry section. You know, meat and potatoes type of, of activities to, to create uh, self-employed jobs, uh, home-based jobs, uh, encourage small business and emerging businesses. And we've laid out a very detailed plan. And we also have a, a, about eight proof of concept activities going now that I'd be happy to talk with you. And you know, because we're working in Washington, D.C. and in Harlem to do Jobonomics Harlem, Jobonomics Washington, D.C., which is its infancy, to create business generators to create these kind of jobs. Well, looking at this chart we have here, we're talking about the uh, grassroots, the business generation, and, and all that. Uh, go over a little bit about this, because we just want to re really want to walk through this and, of course, you're going to be coming back on a recurring basis to plot this growth as far as how we're doing and uh, creating these jobs. But what you're really looking at is more than just jobs. In fact, you want to create small businesses. Absolutely. And I think that's what's separating what you're doing, Chuck, from just everyone Absolutely. else out there is creating the small business, which in turn then will help to create the jobs. Absolutely. As the, uh, the chart shows, is that's a picture of the book, which is available at Amazon.com. I was hoping you were going to plug that for me. Okay, well, we'll do that okay. at the end. Uh, or any online bookstore. But the book really uh, was released uh, less than a year ago. And uh, the first two-thirds of it talk about the problem. And the problem is about the economy. Uh, you mentioned a, a trillion. We actually have spent, uh, since the recession, about $12 trillion. Oh, my goodness. Much and, more than what I even thought. Yeah. I mean, uh, $6 trillion from the Fed, $3 mm -hmm. trillion from the FDIC, $3 trillion from the uh, Treasury. And it has boosted the stock market and because we're power lifting it. But the question is, is it producing the kind of jobs that we, that we really want? And, and the answer is, is largely no. And so uh, we uh, have put together the game plan. The book is the intellectual for the movement, and we have, uh, 
We've interviewed uh, and talked to about 1,500 uh, small business leaders. We've reached out about 3 million people, so it's going viral. But the real proof of the concept is in the, the eight uh, programs. Now, you put up the, the chart on small businesses. It's, it is interesting. You see the pie chart. Uh, there's only 18,000 large businesses. There are 6 million small businesses, and there's 22 million self-employed businesses. So if you take those numbers, 99.7 of all registered firms, and they're not all equal, but all registered firms are small business. And, and small business generate 90% plus of all new jobs. I got another chart that will show you in this decade, small business is producing 99.6 of all the new jobs. Well, this is the whole thing, Chuck. Everybody thinks about we want to get back to the General Motors, the Fords, the General Electrics, and the Westinghouses, and all these you know, old line names, but it really is it's the, the people sitting at home are getting out there with their truck or uh, starting their uh, urban farm or whatever it is. It's actually really creating the employment base and the jobs and the small business is going to really pull us out of this whole thing we're talking about as far as how to create more employment and business Absolutely. opportunity for citizens. The big business guys, the Fortune 500 have not generated a net new job for the last three decades. And so our plan only says of our 20 million, we only have about 10%, 2 million, we're looking for big business. The rest is going to be small, emerging, and self-employed business. Well, this chart, I think, really talks to that, of looking at the, all the new jobs in the United States. And then it just goes, actually, it's not just a pancake. It's actually a minus. Yeah, well, that's what we talked about there. The 40s, uh, we produced 12 million all the way up to 21.7 million jobs. And then, bingo, the, the lost decade uh, hit. And uh, the question is, what's going to happen in the 10s? If we have another decade like we did in, uh, in, in the aughts, uh, then the economy is, is, it cannot flourish. That 9% unemployment rates, and, and that's the official unemployment rates. I, there's ways you calculate unemployment. True unemployment rate is probably around 30%. I was going to say it's at least double what the, uh, the yeah. official rates are. But I want to go back to this, uh, the, uh, the chart we had here. Looking at this uh, uh, small businesses, uh, the six million have. Let's kind of go through this as far as the, the numbers because I think this is very impressive as far as people don't really understand the impact of the economy from people creating their own small business. Yes. I think the argument is, is well, small businesses go out of business a lot quicker than big business. That is true. But the fact is small business are created at a rate significantly faster than big business. So the Census Bureau has come up with some figures over the last 30 years, and it's called exit rate. You take the ones that fail, the ones that enter. Actually, the, the exit rates are better for small business. They, 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 they don't go out of business. The net is better than the big business. Well, looking at this whole thing, too, as far as this, uh, this net net we're talking about, as far as it, even though somebody may start their own home business, it could be, uh, you know, uh, making cookies or they're going out and cleaning apartments or whatever it may be. The fact is they're learning the skills they need that if they go and they work for somebody else, then they usually come back into the job market as their own small business again because it gets in their blood and they want to yeah. do it. So what they learn, the skills and the ideas and the entrepreneurship, of that is really never wasted. That's right. Let's take an example of the vets. You know, I'm a vet, and the vets' unemployment rate are much higher than the average, national average. And so we have created this uh, effort. We're uh, creating a, a, a veterans uh, training center, not to train vets, but teach them, help them. By the time they're done with our course, they'll have their own company, they'll have their own EIN number, they'll have their own website, and they'll know the language of business. So we are teaching vets, returning vets, how uh, to, to start their own veterans, own business, or service disabled veterans. Now, let's say only one out of 10 of those are successful. Well, argument is that they'll hire a lot of their buddies, the other nine. And the other thing is, if a vet comes out, and let's talk about an enlisted vet, you know, that doesn't have, you know, a college degree and all the rest of the stuff. If he tries to get a job in a jobless environment, he is unlikely to get one, just based upon his resume. But he goes back in there and says, I'm you know, Joe the Vet that has my own Joe the Vet Inc. and I specialize in this particular area. I got my own company. Correct. Now, hire me either as a consultant or hire me full time. So the ability for him to compete or her to compete for a job will be much higher. 
Well, let's look at this, uh, this chart. I think this really illustrates some of the things that we're talking about here as far as the uh, small business uh, projections, how they succeed and all that. But let's relate that to the vets and then let's extrapolate this, uh, the Jobonomics Harlem sure. that we're talking about. Sure. And then also Jobonomics Washington, D.C., which is something that's just coming up in the last uh, few months, but actually is accelerated at a very rapid rate. Sure. We had the other chart that showed that last decade we lost about a million jobs, 900,000 to be specific. So we started clocking. This chart shows the every month since the beginning of the decade of 2010s. And what it shows, big business versus small business. In this case, small business is defined by 500 or less. 500, the small business created 99.6% of all the jobs since the beginning of this decade. And what's more important, it's the fact they did it without the banks lending, without very little of the stimulus money. That $12 trillion went to the banks and the big businesses, and very little went to small business. So small businesses have been able to generate 99.6% uh, of all the new jobs. Now, there are only about half as many as we need, but they, I mean, with their hands tied behind their back, they're, they're accomplishing amazing well, at things. at least they're out there doing it. And the whole thing about this, Chuck, looking at this, uh, the chart that you have here, is that we really need to be encouraging. So we have every level of government, the local, the, the state, and the feds, in, in many ways are the impediment uh, to these small businesses. So what can we do? And we're going to leave this chart up here until we exit and uh, come back for the next segment. So what needs to be done in your estimation as far as to encourage uh, these small businesses to be created? And how in turn can those small businesses, like the vets, go out and bring like-kind people in to work with them to create the jobs then that's going to propel the economy uh, in 2011 all the way through to 2020. The, when you talk about the government, we, we've met, we're meeting very regularly with senior officials in the Congress, uh, with mayors, uh, governors, and that type of thing, and I'm asking them for no money. And because I want now that's to, a rarity. Yeah, well, the fact Government's is what I'm asking think, for them is to promote it, adopt it, to support it, uh, help us put the right people be together. Be positive, not be negative, and right. don't stand in the way. Yeah, well, the, the thing is that the United States writ large is, looks at business as a necessary evil, or at best is just a, is a, uh, is a checkbook. What we're trying to say is that you know, business could be part of the solution. Well, actually, what you're saying, Chuck Volmer, is that business is the solution. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing that we need to talk about. And this is the thing that we're looking at as far as the Emerald Plan is concerned around the globe. We're going to talk about jobonomics internationally. And uh, we're going to have Chuck back to talk more about this. And thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. She's had more than a dozen fractures. And in the next few years, she faces two major surgeries to strengthen her fragile bones. She's only 10 years old. Most people don't worry about fragile bones until late in life. For those with osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bones are a concern throughout their lifetime. Find out how you can strengthen this child's future. Diabetes is a killer. After I was diagnosed, I didn't feel sick, so I didn't listen to my doctor. Then it struck. I had a heart attack, then a stroke, and I was only 49. Most people with diabetes also have high blood pressure and cholesterol, which can cause severe heart damage. In fact, two out of three people with diabetes die from heart disease or stroke. Don't let diabetes destroy your life. Call for your free diabetes survival guide. Choose to live.
to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Thank you for being with us on the Emerald Planet as we come to you looking at how we're going to address this rapid population growth going from 7 billion to 9 billion souls by 2050. How are we going to bring the water, the health care, the education, uh, the food, everything that's needed to bring about an increasing an increasing quality of life, not to maintain the status quo or actually to put the developing world further on edge as far as the one billion people do not have access to water, almost uh, two billion people do not have access to adequate food, three and a half billion people, one half of the Earth's population does not have access to wastewater and sanitation. So when you look at all of those challenges, there must be a way to address that. Uh, the gentleman that's uh, sitting next to me, uh, Chuck Vollmer, is the author and founder of Jobonomics. And he's here to attest that uh, he's going to help create 20 million jobs by 2020. He has broad shoulders, but uh, I tell you, that's a mighty task, Chuck. That's a mighty task. Uh, but he has a plan for doing this. And uh, this is what's behind us. The uh, 20 by 20 campaign is right here with us. So Chuck, talk about this and how we're going to take this 20 by 20 and leverage that to get the resources that we need to actually meet the needs of this ever-expanding population base. Well, let's start with the 20 million number. We talked in the last segment about the uh, 1990s, we actually did 21.7 new private sector jobs in the decade. So historically, it, it is very doable. Uh, from a forward-looking viewpoint, we have about 130,000 new workforce entrants every month. And we also have a number of people that we want to get off of the, the welfare and unemployment rolls. And so that equates to about 167,000 jobs a month, which for a decade is 20 million. Uh, that's very doable. Uh, we uh, had a good uh, month last month, uh, the country, about 250,000 jobs. So, so that's our, really fitting into your game plan the, and exactly it really right. relates to this 20, right. uh, 20 by 20. Now, most of the people that talk uh, about, uh, about creating jobs, they look at big business, say, well, big business. Well, big business hasn't and won't uh, because uh, they can't. Uh, the, you know, they, uh, they're, they're creating jobs overseas, they're downsizing, they're increasing their productivity, and God bless them. So, you know, if they can produce 10%, I'll be happy. Uh, but we have about 90%, and we break it into to, to, to four categories as shown on the chart. About 10 million is small and self-employed let's businesses. Bring, let's bring this chart up to the four here so we can uh, let Chuck uh, talk through this whole thing. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. You'll see four blocks in the chart. The big block on the left is 10 million uh, new small and self-employed uh, jobs. The next biggest block is the energy technology revolution, which the Emerald Planet is, and we're working on that. The third biggest block is how do I bring foreign business to the United States uh, and create business, especially in the manufacturing. If, if they're manufacturing and selling TVs, you know, in the United States, they ought to manufacture and, you know, some Absolutely. of those Absolutely. Produce it here if you're going to sell it. Right here. And then 10% for, for large business. But the, the, the real meat and potatoes of this is small and self. And we've got about, about seven or eight initiatives. We're going to talk about the community-based business incubator, which I think is probably the most important. And we'll talk about the Jobonomics Harlem. Okay. The second biggest one is our women-owned businesses. Now, there are uh, uh, 10.1 uh, million women-owned businesses, 90% of them are self-employed. And I'm working with a number of women's groups uh, that and, and they say that all they need is, is to get the mechanics down of how, you know, language of business, how you set a website. And we could double the number of self-employed businesses, and that's 9 million jobs there, or women, and especially in areas that have services, health care, date care, elder care, those types of initiatives. Our next initiative is the elder care initiative, and the elder care initiative is to, is to create uh, centers that we can uh, that provide services to say for example the elderly uh, by 2020 the baby boomers will be 17 million daycare beds or assisted living beds short and they don't because of the economy they don't have uh, the wherewithal to, to to have those so we can create a number of small home-based businesses especially on the maternal side the woman side to provide these kind of on-call uh, care services whether it's just visitation to the next level up of uh, delivery of services to medical services to everything from 
long. And but, also, too, I just want to throw in that this is something, a plan about 20 years ago that I was working on in Northern Virginia, this whole thing of having the elders uh, go into the schools or have sure. uh, set up their own daycare, work with the youth, because as you have more of the nuclear family or you have, as you know about in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., sometimes 80 plus percent heads of household are female, and so they don't have the male figures, they don't have the elders in the home. And so if you can combine these two together, yeah, well, it creates more jobs. The Direct jobs. Care Center will be essentially a, a call center, an information center that will find the talent. They're largely home-based small businesses, and we can work within with the, the local the, community the, itself. Right, mm -hmm. and to provide in-home services. Right. And it just, it's, it's just using uh, the, the, the net. Now, we have other initiatives. We have a cloud computing initiative. We have a uh, real estate initiative. We have a business ministry. So how do you mobilize the 327,000 churches in the United States. Nothing against synagogues, mosques, and all the rest, but we have a, a lot of churches that are underutilized as far as facilities and how, and they're best able to reach out to the long unemployed, uh, term unemployed. And again, they're the, they're the closest to the people within the local communities and what you're doing, Absolutely. Chuck. You're leveraging those natural resources you have within the community to serve the community. Sure. Makes so, and then we have a capital base, the, the base of the, uh, the pyramid, and how do you get the money down to the, to the lower levels? And we have a number of innovative, and you could have a whole show on, on what we're doing there. On the, ener on the energy technology revolution, uh, we want five million new jobs. And if you look at historically, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 50s and the 60s, the military technology mm -hmm. revolution, created tens of millions of new jobs. The military created the airline industry, the aerospace industries, a lot of the manufacturing, and even, you know, Al Gore created the, uh, the, 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 the internet, internet through ARPA. And of course, Velcro <laughs> came out of all this too. <laughs> Absolutely. Then what happened in the 90s, we had the internet technology revolution, the Bill Gates that, and, and the Steve Jobs uh, created uh, the golden nugget to, uh, that came out and created the, the IT. Well, the next one up, the, the, click the slide, and goes on to the, to the ETR, and the ETR is the Energy Technology Revolution, which Emerald Planet is largely, and we want to take a holistic approach about everything from existing fossil fuels, uh, we've got things going on with the, with the natural gas and the coal, we we're looking at some, uh, some exotic technologies, hydrogen, we're looking at... Uh, other type of eco-friendly, like got the, the whole e-waste. Sure, the, the know, wind the, and solar and all these others as but well. But we want to take a, high, a holistic approach, and right now, uh, the approach the United States has taken is just focused on renewables. Now, renewables are good, but it's only 10% of the issue. If we want to look at the other parts of the mm -hmm. things, and I think that, that uh, the economy is going to dictate a, a broader approach. Now, going right into this uh, Harlem project, because this is something that we're looking at for Washington, D.C., and many other cities around the area, so I want you to list the various cities and some okay. of the initiatives once you uh, cover about Harlem and what's going on there. Sure. To put it in context, as I showed you this, the chart before of the, the general game plan and the general initiatives that we have, well, people say, well, here's another book, another idea, another game plan, you know, and, you know, everybody's from Missouri, show me. And so we said, we're going to pick about eight initiatives. We have an inner city initiative, the, the Harlem. We have a minerals initiative uh, to, for, for mining. We have a, a cloud computing initiative. We have a jobonomic center for industrial development to train foreign guys. We have a veterans initiative. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the, the show me, you know, the prove it, the proof of concept. And the idea is of if, a, if, if a couple hundred guys, guys and gals like you and I can create uh, the mechanism for jobs that could, you know, generate hundreds of thousands of jobs. If a couple of hundred could generate scalable uh, businesses for a couple of hundred thousand jobs, what can the country do writ large? Absolutely. And, and looking at this Harlem uh, initiative here, this is something that's very practical. It's, uh, it's on the ground. And go through some of the, uh, the mechanics of what sure. you've uh, put in place for well, that. Well, first of all, if we can do it in Harlem or if we can do it in Anacostia, D.C., or in Detroit, you know, you can, you, can, you can do it anywhere because they're the ones with the highest unemployment rates, et cetera, et cetera. So we have selected Harlem, and the reason we have a champion, and the champion is uh, Michael Faulkner, and he ran for Congress. He didn't win against Charlie Rangel, but he ran under Jobonomics. He ran on the book. And so what we've done is we've created the first piece of the puzzle. The first piece is the Institute for Leadership. 
We want that institute of leadership will bring the young people or the people that want to work for, and we'll work with them to make sure they're quality people that they really uh, are uh, have got the leadership skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next piece is the business generator. Now, people have incubators. We have a generator. And we have, and you, and you and I have talked a long time about this, we have a number of different businesses, for example, the energy audit, to go into residential and audit uh, the homes for, uh, for energy efficiency. Correct. And uh, there are two levels. You can do a walkthrough for about $100, or you can do a sophisticated with IR sensors and blower doors for about $400. Well, we can certify a guy to do energy audit in about four weeks. And the fact is that the utility companies will pay him to do the audit. So it, once we get them certified and they go do it, we have a way to get them paid. Now, these, these people that have this need about 25 grand worth of equipment. So we went out and we had a, a bank, Axion Bank in New York, it said that they will do micro business loans up to $50,000 and they put 20 million bucks to do this. So if I can create an energy audit business, train a guy one after another, one after another, I could be pumping out hundreds of these things. Mm -hmm. Now we have a weatherization thing, we have a music activity, and we have uh, several other things that will generate these jobs. And, and the business plan will be written, we'll train the people to do it, the bank will fund it, and, the, and we, we have a way to get, get them paid. And so that is a highly scalable kind of activity. Now, leveraging this whole thing, looking at uh, Harlem as uh, kind of the, the, the pilot project, how can this then be rolled out across the United States or even overseas to create more jobs and create more home-based businesses? Well, as soon as people here in Washington found out what we were doing in, in Harlem, and I live in the Washington metro, they're saying, well, you don't like us? So you and I went down to uh, Ward 8, which is the toughest neighborhood in D.C. It's got effectively about a 40, 50 percent unemployment rate. It is 98% African-American, which has is, is got some demographic issues of young men, you know, high crime rates uh, inflicted. And 82% of all the households in Anacostia in the 8th Ward are, are, are women uh, households. So they have asked us to come in and ask us to prepare a, a, a menu, uh, which the weatherization office, a male thing, the direct care initiative we talked together would be more of a female type of thing for the women heads of household type. And, and get something going in that way. Okay, we have uh, 15 seconds left. What do you want to leave with our viewers, both here and abroad? Well, I think if you get the term jobonomics in 20 by 20 and, uh, and, uh, and, and socialize it, uh, read the book if you'd like, or just, uh, just uh, advance the notion that we can do it. Go online and uh, read it all there. Thank you for being with us as we come to you, as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet.